All right, so let's get started. Uh, Professor Craig, thank you so much for coming uh, and attending this edition of the bootcamp. We are so honored, you know, to have you join us. Uh, please, you can uh, proceed to share your screen while I stop sharing mine. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. I am going to post a fire picture on my slides here since you're all on fire. <laughs> so, so I want to be keeping in the theme here of having fire. Okay, so just about ready to share my screen. Just one second. I got carried away with the fire there, so I had to add something to my slide there. But we are about to get the share screen going here. Here we go. Share screen. Share. All right, so I got a little fire there. And uh, thank you very much, all of you. <laughs> can you see it? Yes, we can. Yes. Very good. So I got my uh, opening slide. Uh, if uh, you did not get access to the slides, there's a link there at the top of that screen that where you can go to uh, my website, kirkborn.net. Uh, the, the URL for the location of the file, the slides, DS Nigeria 2020. So thank you very much for this invitation, for this opportunity to speak at this extremely important event uh, for all of Nigeria and for the, the young people of Nigeria especially. Uh, I must say that I, I've had a long career in astronomy and data science, uh, a lot of things that I've done in my life, uh, but the joy I've always had is working with uh, the young people who bring new ideas and fresh insights and, and new ways of thinking about things. And all my years at NASA, I was managing teams of people. It was always you know, the, the pleasure of bringing in the, the youngest people. And I still remember some very young interns who came from, to work with us during the summer months who came up with some of the best ideas that we, we saw coming. And so you're all capable of doing that. And I really appreciate this opportunity to, to share with you some ideas and insights around uh, AI and data science, which will hopefully inspire you in your career and in the work you're doing. And it's really uh, the amazing future that we're talking about here. So the, the future of AI uh, is really this idea about creating value from data, but it's not just creating value from data, but it's really creating value at the convergence of many, many different emerging technologies. And that's what we're gonna talk about here. So again, uh, you can follow me on Twitter. I hope you are, uh, and uh, here we go. So we know all about some sort of typical AI and machine learning applications in our lives. And I put these applications under four broad categories of prediction, optimization, discovery, and detection. So for example, we have apps on our smartphones and when we shop online and things like that, that, that predict what we might be interested in buying, what purchases we'd like to make. Even recommender engines, when we shop online, they recommend products, credit scoring that helps us uh, to uh, get a loan perhaps. Uh, so even the smartphone autocomplete on our phones, that when you have a text autocomplete, uh, that's an AI also. Uh, sometimes it does silly things for us when it, it completes the sentence incorrectly. Uh, but that's a predictive algorithm. It predicts what's coming, uh, what's likely to happen. So it also optimizations, optimizing our schedules or maybe our traffic routing on a map to our destination, even optimizing our personalized learning programs. Uh, we have a discovery also. If we have wearable devices or Fitbits or any kind of a sort of health monitoring system, we can detect health issues, discover health issues. We also can discover our best deal when we're online. And then detection. So detection can detect whether our, you know, what's happening with our, our credit, with our banks, uh, many different kinds of things. Well, that's personal, but also in business. We see typically AI and machine learning applications in business and the enterprise in government and agencies at any place in the world actually, but it's, it's still in these same four categories of prediction, optimization, discovery, and detection. So for, for example, organizations and businesses want to predict you know, outcomes or events, prices, costs, risks, product demand, a lot of prediction going on. We also want to optimize the delivery of our services, supplies, and personnel. So optimizing processes, processes, and people. And then we like to discover uh, insights. So businesses want to discover what's going on in their market. What are people saying about our product online and social media? Uh, discovery of information and, and quarterly business reports and other kinds of documents, or even when customers call the call center, you know, what, what is the sentiment of the customer? So discover if our customers are happy or not happy with what we're doing. And of course, detection, detecting fraud, detecting anomalies, uh, uh, safety events, risk events, 
risky behaviors in our business or in our organizations or even in our communities or even in our system. So cybersecurity or data breaches. So these are the typical kinds of things that we do in all of our organizations, as well as in our personal lives. And if you want to learn more about any particular industry, I found this really cool website uh, where you can explore interactively uh, this website. So uh, this is an interactive site. So you can click on one of those uh, categories there that's listed, for example, healthcare, or automotive, financial services, uh, telecommunications, retail, entertainment, manufacturing, energy. Just You can just click on one of those. And you can see sort of what the potential impact of AI is in that sector, uh, sort of what the de uh, degree of maturity of the different applications in that sector. So there's, it's really kind of fun to just explore that because you have all these different options there you can explore. So I found this chart quite interesting. It talks about sort of typical AI technologies driving business value uh, because my message is always about value creation. When I talk about data science or data analytics, AI, any of those kind of things, I'm always talking to people, like what, what the most important thing is not the cool tool, the cool uh, Python code that you can write. That's great, it's wonderful, you need to know how to do that. It's not the cool machine learning algorithms, all that really neat mathematics that goes into machine learning. Yeah, I love that stuff, but when you're talking to a client or, or a business customer, or even your boss or your colleague, it's really about what value are you creating from those cool tools, right? So yeah, we love the cool tools, but it's really about value. So think about a sporting event, for example, a football game, you put the best players on the field and everyone loves the best players and they have uh, cool looking uniforms. The colors are bright and colorful. It's really exciting, but it's really about right, the value. It's about winning the game. It's about victory, uh, victory in your business, victory in your organization. Uh, so the colors are nice, but the colors are not what's gonna get you there, even though they might inspire you. So, so those tools and things you're learning, uh, those are sources of inspiration for you, sources of inspiration that drive you to create value. And so when we see these uh, sort of five general areas of, interestingly, one of them is image recognition. And there's a long list of ways we, we, we do image recognition, both to uh, identify products and services and images, uh, to detect uh, people's uh, uh, facial recognition or even sentiment or emotion from their faces. Uh, we can monitor, uh, uh, for example, assembly lines or construction sites or even disaster areas or floods, for example, from satellite imagery, we can analyze all kinds of things from images. But the other four categories there are all related to language. Language, speech, chatbots, natural language generation, sentiment analysis, analyzing language, because language is one of our greatest tools of communication. So language itself is data. When we speak, it's data. When we hear other people speak, it's data. So it's not surprising that a lot of our, natu our uh, AIs are basically doing exactly what our eyes and our ears and our mouth are already doing, right? We're speaking, we're seeing, we're hearing, and that's exactly what all these algorithms are doing. It's really uh, all about creating value from this thing called artificial intelligence. But I always like to tell people, even though artificial intelligence starts with the word artificial, there is nothing artificial about artificial intelligence. It's if it is artificial, then it's not creating value. We want to create real value. So the real value of AI is augmented intelligence and accelerated intelligence and amplified intelligence. It's these other things that are real value to our organization. And what that real value creation looks like is it's AI is taking our data streams, no matter what they are, images or sound or, or text, any, everything is data. Like we, we just heard in the introduction, it's not just about databases and numbers, it's about everything, images and videos and texts and documents and online social media and everything is data. Even your face is data, right? So you can detect whether someone's happy or unhappy when, they, when they're looking at your product and an, an image online. If someone posts a video online about the product, the company brand, they can use AI to detect their, their product in the video. They can detect their brand in the, in the video. They can find the logo or they can find the product. And then once they find the product, they can identify is someone happy or unhappy with that product. So now we're creating value from our data. We're creating value from our AI. So AI is taking data to some insights. And from those insights, it leads to us making better decisions and taking actions. And that ultimately leads to value. And that, that's what we're really trying to do here. So I put AI into these three broad categories and we've already saw two of them on the previous slide. First, image understanding. Number two, language understanding. And number three, I think is really sort of the capstone or the over, 
arching umbrella term or concept around AI, and that's context understanding. Sort of understanding the whole context, the environment in which something is happening. So it's not just the things we see and the words we hear and the sounds we hear. And it's not, it's not just about those things, it's about the full context, the cognitive awareness of your environment before you take it an action. So you can learn the next best action and take the next best decision when you have full cognitive and context understanding of your environment. And that's really what the AI is moving toward. It's not just understanding images and language, even though that's very important, that's part of it. But, where, but how, what is the context in which that image is seen? What is the context in which those words are spoken? That's all important. So at the end of the day, it's really about data. Okay, so yes, we're producing value, but really if we don't have the data, if we don't have the input, it's like fuel for the car. If you don't have the fuel for the car, you're not going anywhere. But what's important to remember is it's, all, it's not about the car, it's not about the fuel. What's important is where you're going, you know, the destination or even the journey, all right? The fuel gets you there, but what's important is the journey that you're on and the place that you're going to. So AI helps us get to the destination, that value creation, but none of that goes anywhere without data. So some people say AI consumes data. That's like eats data, right? But I like to say AI devours data, that it just eats everything in sight. It, it uses all possible data. All right, and that gets, gives us more than just tasks and decisions, but it brings us to that desirable outcomes and, and a, a pure cognitive way of using our AI to emulate the way humans react to the world. We react cognitively. We just don't look at one little thing. We look at the full environment, hopefully, what's going on and make a decision. So action creation, decision-making comes from discovering patterns in data. So it's not just bits and bytes. It's not just the, the numbers, the, the ones and the zeros. You got language and text and images to a computer are just ones and zeros, right? So there's still, it's still all about numbers, right? When we feed an image or, or a, a lump of text to a mathematical algorithm, it sees bytes, right? It sees ones and zeros. But what we see as humans are patterns. So we're training our AI to see patterns. And the patterns enable us to understand our world in order to make a better decision and a better action and ultimately create value. So what are these, what are these patterns? Well, I like to call them insights discovery. That is four categories. Finding the classes, that is the segments and subsegments of the things in your population, whether it's objects, events, people, or behaviors. And not only just learning the segments and the, and the groups of things, but what are the different rules that constrain them? What separate them one from another? What are the boundaries between the different groups and classes? So class discovery or segment discovery is number one. Number two is correlation discovery. So correlation is like finding a, a, a relationship between X and Y. You know, given X, you can find Y. So that's, a, that's essentially predictive power discovery. A correlation or a trend in data, a, a pattern which is a trend uh, between some different variables in your data set, that, that correlation can give you predictive power discovery because if you find X, you can, you can then predict Y. But we learned in statistics class that correlation does not necessarily imply causation. That is, X doesn't necessarily cause Y to increase or cause Y to decrease. It just correlates. But if you can find those variables, those insights, that, as I call them, those other variables, there's other dimensions in your data set, which are the causal variables, which did cause Y to increase. Maybe X didn't cause Y to increase, but maybe there's another variable. There's another environmental condition. That is, this is the contextual understanding that I talk about, understanding the context of the situation. There's other insights, other environmental variables, other conditions, which actually caused that thing to increase or decrease. And once we learn those things, then we can make adjustments. If we don't like the prediction that we're making, we can, instead of saying, we don't like that prediction and just say, okay, let's just leave it. No, we're gonna do something about it. And that's called a prescription. So prescriptive power discovery is an aspect of discovering correlation in high dimensions, because not only do you find correlations between variables, but you find the causal variables which are causing the increases. So you can now take an action to improve an outcome to improve revenue or to improve customer satisfaction, or maybe to decrease something like decrease risk or de decrease loss. Okay, so there's things we can do to increase or decrease from prescriptive power discovery that comes from correlation discovery. 
Number three is my favorite. I call it surprise discovery. Statistics books call it outlier detection or sometimes anomaly detection. But I say it's really about finding the surprising unexpected thing in your data. And sometimes that unexpected thing is right in the middle of the data set. Sometimes there's, there's something there that sh there should not be a data point at the very center of the data set. But sometimes there is something there and that's a surprise. So the statistics book would not call that an outlier because it's not an outlier, it's in the middle of the data set. It's an inlier, but it's still a surprise. So finding the surprising unexpected thing for me is the most exciting part of data science. So again, finding these patterns in data enable us to create an automated algorithm through machine learning that could ultimately fuel an AI to take action, make a decision and take action. But there's still one more on this list, which is also the, probably the most powerful technique in the world of analytics. The most powerful technique in the world of data science and machine learning is link discovery, association discovery. Sometimes it's an application of network science. You know, finding the connections that aren't connected, finding the dots that aren't connected finding the things that are connected through an intermediary. So there may not be any relationship, no connection between A and C in a database, but they do connect through B. And that B is the intermediary, which drives the, the causal behavior, drives the outcome. And so when you can discover those intermediary relationships, find, our, like Mark, this is an example of like marketing attribution, find the person in the middle or money laundering, find the person in the middle or risk and that causal factor risk analysis. Sometimes it's the cause in the middle. It's, the, it's in the middle. So link and association discovery is extremely powerful for connecting the dots that connected in your data set. So all these patterns that we discover in data help drive better insights and therefore decisions and ultimately action and value. <coughs> so here's a list of some of the emerging technologies in recent years and in the years looking ahead. So some of these things are already with us and some are coming or, and some are uh, exploding right now. So there's a rapidly expanding frontier of the emerging technologies. And I'd say that many of these, if not most of these innovations in these uh, technologies are inspired by data. They're informed by data and they're enabled by data. And what's really great is they create value and jobs from data. And I really believe that AI is sort of driving this frontier. It's driving things forward because AI is automating, accelerating, amplifying, augmenting our natural intelligence. That's the real A in AI, not artificial, augmented intelligence, accelerated, amplified. All of these emerging technologies are being amplified and accelerated by the data information, data informed actions and decisions that AI enables. So look at all those things in that list. Don't try to memorize them all. I'm going to cover a few of them right now for you. So if you probably know some of these things, but I'm just, I'm going to show you a progression of some of the concepts, emerging technologies that you just saw on the preceding slide. So for machine learning, I'm sure many of you already being very successful in this bootcamp to be here participating in this AI bootcamp, you probably already know this, but I'm gonna just say it anyway, that's gonna help us move forward to the other concepts. So I like to define machine learning by the simplest definition that I've ever seen. And this is the first definition I saw of machine learning over 20 years ago. I just, I'd already been doing many years of as an astrophysicist, as an astronomer. Then I discovered machine learning and said, wow, what is this cool stuff? And I looked up a definition for what it was and it said, algorithms that learn from experience. And that seemed kind of strange to me. I said, that's a very simple definition. <laughs> mathematical algorithms that learn from experience. So really what it means is that these are ma mathematical algorithms that help you build models that learn the characteristic patterns and data that's in order to get things right. That is to classify it right or to diagnose it right, to get it right. So those characteristics, patterns and training data is what we call learning from experience, learning from the training data. So whether it's digit detection, for example, on, in postal code readers, they, they try to read the digits that people write on their letters and their, and their documents and, and packages that they mail. This is really actually a form of image recognition, right? Recognizing the, the image of a number direct to know what the number is. Postal code or digit al detection algorithms are an example of an machine learning algorithm 
that learns the characteristic pattern of numbers to get them right. Email spam detection. Well, how many times have we needed this in our lives, right? Being able to classify an email as a spam or a not spam or a ransomware or not a ransomware or phishing or not phishing. All right. So this is very important in our daily lives because we get so much of this. That's an algorithm. And then also, uh, I should say, and, and, machine, and spam detection is mostly based upon language detection, language understanding. Uh, the uh, digit detection, the first one I mentioned, is both image understanding and language, that is numbers, because sometimes postal codes have letters, so understanding that those are letters and numbers, so that's a, that's a form of language understanding, but starts with image understanding. But then we get to things like uh, medical imaging diagnosis, for example, cancer detection. Understanding what are the patterns in an image of someone, a medical image, to determine whether that's really a cancer or maybe it's not a cancer. Maybe it's just an injury or a bruise or inflammation or some kind of scar tissue, and it's not necessarily a cancer. So understanding the patterns to get it right. So there are mathematical algorithms that do all of those things I just said. And when you apply those models, then you have AI, okay? So AI is the application of the models that we just talked about, the machine learning mathematics we just talked about. AI is using data to inform and initiate actions. So the first three examples of this are just the three I showed on the previous slide, right? Email spam detection, uh, digit detection on postal codes, or, or medical image diagnosis. Those are all applications of mathematical algorithms. There's also other things, I mean, millions, millions of other examples that just a few mentioned here, uh, like credit card fraud alerts, again, finding the patterns and then taking an action, a uh, conversational AI that, that is chatbots. Okay, again, listening to data, okay, listening to a person talk, that's data, and then being able to uh, actually create a conversation, that's an application. And of course, product recommendations, which are built upon mathematical techniques and recommender engines, which include linear algebra, and association mining and a lot of different interesting techniques, predictive analytics. Those applications lead to the actual recommendation engine, which is really a predictive model that the customer will likely buy this product. So the real power of AI, like I said, is nothing artificial about it at all. <coughs> Excuse me. So robotics is a specific branch of AI that's concerned with the, about creating devices that move and react to sensory input. In other words, re re moving and reacting to data from sensors. Remember, it's all data driven. All of these emergent technologies have some data connection. And there's, whether it's in the manufacturing assembly line or products uh, that roam around your house or in uh, retail and, um, and uh, products and goods, warehousing and logistics, to even including a, a prosthetic devices on people, uh, for example, a prosthetic arm seen in the gentleman in the image on the right there. So devices that move and react to sensory input, in other words, data from sensors, that's robotics. So think of drones as an example of a robot. It happens to be an unmanned flying robot, but it's still like a robot. It can, and it can fly either by human control or most likely it cannot fly autonomously uh, through using software controlled flight plans or onboard sensors, including GPS or even computer vision to know how to navigate a terrain. These are being used in all kinds of uh, applications in the world, including for fun. People use these for fun and games, but also they can be used for disaster response, uh, for uh, military operations, uh, for civic operations, for example, traffic monitoring, uh, other kinds of devices uh, that we can fly on drones and can then be released into an environment, if, for example, to fight a fire, for example. But the drone is this autonomous flying robot uh, that has onboard sensors, that is data uh, providers, data collectors that help it to navigate its world and do the application that it's assigned to do. So another example of this is autonomous vehicles. I'm sure we're all familiar with things like this, of course, self-driving cars, trucks, and taxis, and so on. These are, again, these are self-driving devices, happen to be vehicles, that are informed by data, once again, data, streaming from many different kinds of sensors, cameras, and LIDAR, and radar. 
And from these streaming data, the vehicle makes a decision and takes an action, which is based upon algorithms, which are fed by data. So again, we, we get the measure of algorithms, the mathematics, the data, the sensors, the decision, and the ultimate action that comes from all of that. And ultimately it's about the value, right? So the self-driving vehicle this isn't just driving around for fun, it's taking you somewhere. It's going to a destination. Self-driving trucks, they're delivering products uh, to destinations, to customers and, and to manufacturers, from manufacturers uh, to, the, to, to the retailers, to the sellers. So it's delivering value, uh, all driven by data. So an exciting one is, uh, is 4D printing. Oh, I didn't say 3D. No, I said 4D printing. So we're familiar with 3D printing. It's, it's otherwise called additive manufacturing. The process of making a physical object from a 3D digital model of the thing by lay, laying down layers of material successively and stacking them on top of one another, you can make a 3D model of something. And the model, the digital model is again, data informed. It's, a, it's data about how to build that thing. So what's 4D printing? Well, 4D printing is real. It's act, you got three dimensions in space, but there's also time. So 4D printing is about building in electronic sensors in the, in the object that you print that allows it to detect different conditions and then change shape as a result of the, de of the detected conditions. So it's data informed allowing the, the printed object, and I, I say printed very loosely here because it's not coming off a printer. It's some kind of a, a real world device. And the example that I, I heard the most about, if you, if you look at this uh, TED talk on 4D printing, is a medical stent inside someone's heart artery. The shape of the stent will change based upon the physical and medical conditions of the patient. For example, their blood pressure or their stress level, or their body temperature or other kind of medical conditions to change the shape of the stent using carbon nanotubes, which are wild, wired with electronic sensors that detect data, that is the, the, the medical conditions of the patient. So data informed, allowing the thing to change shape in time. So that's 4D, okay? It's not really printing in a sense of printer, but it's 4D shape shifters. And this is a really interesting new technology emerging, 4D printing. Virtual reality, I'm sure we're all familiar with virtual reality, right? But it's really about a data-driven system, right? You're creating a world. Well, the world is informed by data, right? It's a model, it's a simulation of a 3D world, but it's informed by data. And then when you interact in that environment, for example, you can put on a helmet with gloves and screens and, and glasses, and you can interact in a VR environment. I've done this, it's pretty, it's a lot of fun. Uh, so you can play games in it and have family adventures, but also it's very useful in training and education medical treatments, even in designing products, and just exploring data in three in high dimensions. So these gloves and helmets and, and, and glasses you wear, these are data collectors. That is, you, when you touch something, you, you, the glove senses it, or when you see it through the glasses, your eye, your, the glasses see it and project that image onto your eyes. So they're data collectors, but they're also data generators. And by that, I mean, you can interact with this environment and change it. You can push something and move something or lift something or if you're exploring data, you can, you, can, you can change the axes on the, on the data that you're exploring just by waving your hands around. So it's generating uh, results from the signals that your hands are giving, that your eyes are giving, all right? How you're moving through the environment, that's generating data, which is fed back into the VR environment so that it knows how to interact with you. So it's not just a fun place that's static, it's changing dynamically through data collection and data generation. Now you take that concept of virtual reality and put yourself back in the real world. So you're still in your real world, but now you, you overlay in your real world additional information. So it's like virtual reality, except it's augmented reality because you're still in your real world, but it's overlaid with data from multiple sources. For example, this person on the left is holding up a phone that shows them the picture of the store on their phone that they're looking at, but tells them where the special prices are today. Or then in the middle frame there, the people are uh, responding to a flood situation, a disaster response, looking for uh, you know, emergency response to, to people and to things that are happening. 
And the person can hold up their phone and the, and the phone can identify, for example, where there's downed electrical power lines, some kind of danger ahead or something like this. Again, overlaying information onto your real world environment. And this is sort of fun, the one on the right, the, this person is actually trying on clothes without even trying them on for real, right? Uh, so she can look at herself in the mirror wearing the, the clothes that she selected to see what they look like. So we have examples of AR and retail, disaster response, medical procedures and games, all kinds of things like this. But I think it's a real value for communities and the specific application is in security, for example, in airports and shopping malls and sporting events and entertainment events. For example, identifying people who may be maybe having a health condition. Maybe someone is in a real need of medical attention. And so the augmented reality can identify that person and even point it out. So if someone could hold up a computer monitor and say, here's the person in the crowd who maybe needs attention or something is going on at that particular location, we can transmit systems to, to devices, from devices, uh, to applications and from applications. So remember, we're, all of our devices, even ourselves, are data collectors and data generators. But the greatest data collector will be the Internet of Things. So the Internet of Things are about devices everywhere in the world uh, that are streaming data to fuel these models and applications that we've been talking about, AI, machine learning, as well as augmented reality and virtual reality, and including robotics, autonomous vehicles, drones, and all of those things. So sensors everywhere, that's the Internet of Things, whether it's wearable devices on our person or connected cars in the public area, but also in, in, in retail and manufacturing with connected products or in the, uh, in the farm, precision farming, or in, in, in any industry, anywhere. So the Internet of Things is just gonna be an enormous creation of data. So I like to just call it the Internet of Everything. Okay, so Internet of Everything. When we start collecting these different sources of data, we do what a human does when they have multiple inputs. We, we are cognitive, humans are cognitive. We use our eyes and our ears. We use everything when we enter our environment that we can connect in different ways. Basically, it's a hyper growth of data. It's combinatorial, that is, there's so many combinations of the different types of data we're collecting to give us intelligence at the edge, at the point of data collection. And it reminds me a lot of this quote from a famous uh, scientist from many, many years ago. Uh, Leonardo da Vinci said, learn how to see and realize that everything connects to everything else. So that's what we're doing here. We're connecting everything else. And those connections, remember that link discovery and association discovery I talked about on that pattern discovery graph. Uh, it's about insights from connecting the dots and seeing things that are connected, even if they're connected through an intermediary and maybe they're not connected directly, but through something else. That's real insight discovery. The Internet of Things will allow us to do that. And that's really important because once we have all these different types of data, we're not, going to be, we're not going to be able to put these things into normal databases. And that's a good idea not to do that because the natural data structure of the world is not rows and columns of numbers. The natural data structure of the world is a graph. That is, it's about the entities and the relationships between them. And we're seeing applications everywhere in healthcare and security and energy and life science and markets and finance, it's everywhere. Finding relationships and how they're connected to one another is the most powerful data structure in the world. And so when we have multiple sensors and multiple data collecting sources, we can see how they relate to one another, not in any kind of relational database, because that would take forever to insert all those different streams of data into relational databases. But we can immediately, from the moment we collect data, realize that this event is like that event, or this person's behavior is like that person's behavior or this product is like this other product. We can start finding connections across the graph of knowledge, the, the graph of all of our environment, the entities and the relationships between them. Graph analytics, the most powerful tool in data science and in AI, because that is what we do as humans. Our natural intelligence does this. It connects the dots, it sees the relationships, just like Leonardo da Vinci said, we see how things are connected then we make decisions and take actions based upon all those things that we see. And so our best AI is one that uses this technique of graph analytics and linked data. 
So there's applications everywhere. And you can see it everywhere, energy and health and medicine and farming and cities and traffic and maintenance, even in your own personalized learning and personalized finances, it's everywhere. Everything is now becoming smart, you know, smart cities and smart farms and smart homes. Everything's becoming predictive, like predictive maintenance and predictive farming, you know, predictive marketing, precision, precision medicine, precision farming, and ultimately personalized, personalized to you, to your specific needs and wants and preferences at this moment. So the more data we have and the more tools like AI that we have, the smarter that we can become, or smarter that our cities can become, the smarter that our businesses can become, or smarter that our whole environment can become to make a better world for all of us. So what, what we're doing here is now really moving intelligence to the edge of the network. So the AI that we're putting into our sensors is essentially putting the intelligence in the data collector itself. Maybe not exactly, but pretty close. There are now sensors that is a All of these things I talked about are an example of what uh, I learned about many years ago. It's interesting. This is DDDAS, Dynamic Data Driven Application Systems. So, work backwards from that. First, it's a system of things uh, there's devices, collection, actions, decision making. It's a system, so, but it's an app, a real application. So, it has, it's applying to something in the real world. And it's data driven, so the data informs the action, informs the decision, and it's dynamic. Okay, so it's not just a static data driven thing. You look at the data one year from now and say, I should have done this one year ago. It's dynamic in the moment at the point of data collection. And if you look up this uh, concept of data driven, dynamic data driven application systems, you'll see there's four components, there's four steps that take you from data to action. And those steps are measurement that is collecting data from any type of sensor. Inference and prediction. Okay, so basically using the machine learning models to find the patterns, the class discovery, the correlation discovery, the surprise discovery, the association discovery. So we infer what those things mean, and then we predict what the outcome would be if we take different decisions. So it's predictive because you say, I learned from the data that if I take this action, this will happen. If I take this other decision, this other thing will happen. So inference and prediction are where the machine learning and the AI and the data science is happening, right? So measurement is the data collection, the inference and prediction is the data science step, and then ultimately we want to take action. That is steering our resources, taking action. And sometimes those actions can be automated, which we call our AI, actionable intelligence, gathering actionable intelligence insights, I should say, from our streaming sensor data to automate any data-driven operational system. So that sometimes is called robotic process automation or business process automation. Some of those are not very intelligent. They just duplicate what people do and, and just automate it. But intelligent process automation is better where it actually finds the patterns that it and the actions it should be taking from the data. All data informed, dynamic data-driven application systems. So I've shown you a lot of applications of AI, which are informed by data, enabled by data, create value and innovation from data. But there's one more application I wanna mention. And that application is applying AI back onto the data. That is AI for AI or AI for machine learning or AI for data science. That is making our data smarter and more intelligent to make our better use of our data. That is labeling the data, tagging the data, annotating the data with what it means. How is, what does this data mean? What is its content? What is its context? What else is it related to? Build a link, linked data graph, build a graph database using semantics, that is the meaning of the data, or class hierarchies, or tags that people use as they just to describe things. So making our data smart enables our, our AI to be even more intelligent because it's now can retrieve the right data for the right application and the right action at the right time in the right context. Isn't that better than just sending raw numbers and bits and bytes, ones and zeros to an AI? Send it some meaningful data, send it smart data. So some examples of smart data, for example, are images. You can label what's in an image. You can create labels, not just for the image as a whole, but for individual scenes or pixels within a data. Remember I mentioned earlier, for example, let's say you post a selfie on Twitter or Facebook 
And then that selfie, you're holding for a particular product, a particular branded product. So that company can identify their brand and their product in that image. And then they, then they can identify uh, your, your sentiment, your, whether you're happy or sad, what you're, what you're doing. So it identify, so it can segment the image into the product, into your face, into the environment around you. So it's image segmentation and scene labeling is a great way of making your data smarter. Then you can say, find me all scenes or find me all videos or find me all pictures or photos that contain this product or this person or this environment, or this, uh, or this game, or this event, or whatever. Smart data. Text, okay, basically extracting content, context, and sentiment from text makes the data smart. Labeling the text. Not just say, here's a document, but I can tell you what's in the document, and the context of the document, even the sentiment of the document. The topics, and whether the topics are evolving over time by looking at a whole collection of documents. I can build topic models, topic evolution models. Generally, it's about anything, any kind of sensors, creating all those links and tags uh, and annotations, and we can build a knowledge graph. Find me all other things that had this type of thing in it. That's the knowledge graph. Connect all those dots for context understanding. And that's why the Internet of Things is really about the Internet of Context. And sometimes I call it insights as a service or even smart data as a service. So it's all about these labels and tags and annotations. So one quick example on machine uh, image understanding. Remember, these, are, these tags and annotations are helping the machine learning models and AI understand the data. That is intelligent data understanding. So remember what I'm saying here. This is applying AI to the data in order that the, da a the data can be smarter for the AI application you're using the data for. So for example, we can use computer vision to tag the content of images and video, you can label it. So now you not only just can label it, but you can search for all scenes and all images and all videos or whatever that have particular products or events or persons or whatever. So that makes the data smarter. If you wanna identify a particular type of pattern, you wanna be able to, in a, in a huge collection of videos, it's smart, it's smart to tag those videos. And if you re require humans to do this, that's impossible. But you want the AI to do this. You want an automatic algorithm to do this for you. And that's what the AI, the AI is being applied to your data to make your data smarter for the AI where you're going to use that data. Likewise, for language understanding. Again, it's helping the machine learning and AI applications understand the data that is intelligent data understanding. So what can we do with documents? We can understand the concepts in the documents. We can, we can identify the topics and see if those topics are emerging or drifting over time by looking at a collection of documents. We can detect sentiment, that is emotion and things like that. We're tagging these documents. Remember, it's all about tagging and annotating to make the data smart, smart data, content tagging, context tagging, even entity identification and tagging. For example, specific people or specific places or specific products that are mentioned in the document Tag it, say this is person is mentioned here, this product is mentioned there. And not only that, but we can extract numbers from documents, all right? Understanding, when you do text understanding and language understanding that certain things in the document are numerical quantities and not just numbers, but they're numbers which have variable values. For example, this city is 10 kilometers from that other city. This city has a, a 1,000 more people than this other city. So we not only have a number there, but we have a, the, the, the dimension, for example, kilometers or the number of people. And we also have a relationship between cities. Okay, we have relationships and dimensions and quantities. So we can extract that. So language understanding gives us all this power to make our data smarter, to make our documents and text smarter. So tags, labels, and annotations Therefore, they will not just data-driven AI, but knowledge-driven AI. That's really exciting. Like tags, I should say tags, it says tabs there. Tags, labels, annotations make structured smart data out of unstructured data. That is, those labels can be, then be searched and curated, maintained in a database, building linked graphs, knowledge graphs off of it. We can make that smarter data make it structured that we can do analytics on those tags from unstructured data. So these tags, labels, and annotations enable data indexing, 
data filtering, data flow orchestration to our AI, subscription services and query capability to make our AI operations smarter and faster, more intelligent. So I say the past, present and future of data is AI, is AI. Making your data smarter by applying AI to your data. So that would make it AI powered data science, AI infused data science, AI enabled data science, even AI for data science. So that's pretty exciting. It's putting data, using AI for AI, using AI for data and, da and making smart data for AI. And there's been many different links to documents and websites on my slides here. So when you, when you see those links, like you see in this slide, uh, th those are places you can go and learn more about the things I'm talking about. So there's some final remarks here. And uh, I just want to make a comment here. That is, uh, I added a few extra slides from the original version that I sent to the uh, organizers of the bootcamp. Uh, so my apologies to those uh, who, when I see, you see some new slides that may not be in your set, but I'm gonna have a link there. When I, get, when I get to those new slides, I'm gonna have a link there where you can go and find those new slides. So before I get to that, I just have this list here of some 10 amazing AI advancement we can expect to see in the next few years. Remember I talked about this talk, uh, this talk is the future of AI. And I found a really interesting article that talks about these 10 amazing advancements. And I encourage you to check those out. Uh, I'm not gonna read all of these things to you. You can go read the article, you can look back at these slides, but it's in all many different sectors and industries and parts of our lives and parts of, you know, parts of the world. Uh, some really interesting things. So if you're into cybersecurity, for example, look at the last one there. Using behavior analytics, the behaviors of actors, that is people or bots on your, on your network. Okay, so that's so doing behavioral analytics to help you identify anomalous behavior, surprising behavior, unexpected behavior, okay, based upon patterns of how people are using your network. And then you can set up basic and autonomous reconfiguring AI to reconfigure networks, for example, to lock down the database or to lock down the data sources in case you think perhaps there's an adversary or a bot that's trying to steal the data uh, from your network. So autonomous operations in cybersecurity is one of those great things we're gonna see in the next few years using behavior analytics. That is the patterns of behavior of the actor in your network. Again, an actor, either a human actor or a bot and identifying those which are anomalous unusual, surprising, unexpected. Many, many different cool things like that. Number seven, I'll just mention number seven because when I read this article, I thought this was really pretty interesting. And that is in the field of journalism. That is, in the future, I imagine that uh, journalists will not necessarily need to go into very dangerous situations, very dangerous environments, dangerous locations. For example, reporting of some maybe serious a uh, political event, or maybe some serious uh, natural disaster like a flood or a major storm or a landslide or something like this. Uh, instead, they'll send out cyborg reporters. Now, what's that? Well, basically it's a, it's a robot. Uh, it doesn't have to look like a human robot like it does in the picture here, but basically collecting data, conducting interviews, but it's not a real person. It, okay, it's a bot or a robot, if you will. And again, it doesn't have to be a robot that looks like a human. It's just some kind of bot maybe deployed even on a drone with a camera and a microphone and interviewing or collecting data about that dangerous location. So this is a really interesting application we're gonna see. So these are some examples of the future of AI in many different industries. <clears throat> but there's really one real true future of AI and that's you. Yes, <laughs> that's you. You are the future of AI. And this little link here that you see on the slide here, as a link where I have the, this slide and a couple more slides, which are the ones that I added uh, that weren't in the original set of slides I sent to your, the bootcamp organizers. So uh, apologies for those who don't see it, but you can find it on this website, kirkborn.net forward slash future of AI. So kirkborn.net slash future of AI. The future is you. So it's really all about your data science, your journey to data science maturity. And I say it's like sailing the seven seas. Now this is old metaphor that people used to talk about, sailing the seven seas, which basically means to explore your world. So sailing the seven seas was just a way of saying that you're just gonna explore your world. You're, you're just gonna go explore everything that's out there. And that's what we're doing with data. We're exploring our world. 
the seven C's. Now it's really what I just, what I did here was I, I, I came up with these aptitudes that are really important for successful data scientists. And I started making this list. I realized that they all started with the letter C. So I call it the seven C's with the letter C, but in fact, I came up with 12. So it's really 12 C's. <coughs> Excuse me. So what are these aptitudes that make for a successful data science career? Well, you're curious, you're curious, you ask questions. You're creative, you're a good communicator, which is important because data storytelling is one of the most important aspects and aptitudes of a data scientist, being able to tell the data story, tell the what, the so what, and the now what, so that people, decision makers, bosses, and your clients and customers understand what you did and why it's important and what they should do about it. What, so what, and now what, good communicator. Continuous lifelong learning. Well, that's exactly what you're doing now, participating in this boot camp. And keep this up for your whole life because we're always learning. You're always learning your whole life. You know, I've, I've, been, I've been around a few years in my career, but I'm still always learning. Be a continuous lifelong learner. You'll always be relevant and important to whoever you work for. Also successful data scientists are collaborative because we work as a team. We're cool under pressure. That is something we know that there's not necessarily a right answer and a wrong answer. That's what it means to be a scientist. You realize that sometimes there is no absolute right answer. Especially as a data scientist, we know that there's a statistical uh, probability associated with our answer being right or wrong, right? So cool under pressure, being able you can tolerate the fact that sometimes there is no single right answer. You're also a courageous problem solver, finding solutions to problems that maybe the solutions that people didn't expect or didn't want, so you're, you're willing to rock the culture. But not only that, but your willingness to fail. I mean, that's what we mean by a problem solver. You're willing to learn from your failures. That's what science is all about. That's what machine learning is all about. We learn from experience. Remember what I said, machine learning are algorithms that learn from experience. That is learning from wrong models. Science learns from wrong theories. Human beings, that is young children, learn from making wrong actions, taking wrong actions. We all learn from our fail, failures. So a courageous problem solver is willing to fail and learn from failure. And there's five more, the critical thinker. Be able to ask those questions, the who, what, when, where, why, and how questions. But not just these soft aptitudes, but the hard skills that go with it. But so you have a computational aptitude, computational literacy, computational thinking, that is coding. You're also consultative, that is your customer focus. You know how to ask questions and listen to the answers from your customer. What do they want from this AI? What do they want from this data? What do they want from this application I'm building? And it's not what you're building that matters. It doesn't matter that you're building some cool deep learning with multi-layered neural networks, with back propagation and all kinds of cool stuff. Yeah, that's fun and cool. But the customer doesn't care about that. They, they want to know what's important here. What the what, the so what, and the now what. Listen to what they want. Be consultative. And also you're compassionate. That is you listen with empathy or you're willing to, to listen to someone else who has a different opinion and try that, try that out. Maybe the customer doesn't want that cool deep ne learning neural network. Maybe they just want a very simple regression model, a logistic regression. Don't give me this complicated stuff. Give me a logistic regression. Okay, because they need to explain it to their customer, their client, their stakeholder, their boss. So we listen with empathy. And number 12, we're community focused. This is what you're doing here in these hackathons. This is what you do in boot camps, right? We're finding solutions to interesting problems, using data for good or AI for good. This is a natural, very common and universal characteristic across the world of data scientists and the data science community is doing data for good. So as data science and AI practitioners, we are explorers. We're exploring these vast and endless seas of data to bring value and discovery and insights to tough business problems, to tough, tough community problems, to tough world problems, to even tough personal problems. We're exploring vast and endless seas of data, data explorers. So when I thought about that, I, I remember this quote uh, from this poet. I thought this was really cool and appropriate for us because it's, it's an inspirational quote about building a ship. But we're building a ship, we're data scientists. So we're building a ship of data, data science, a, a building a ship of AI and machine learning to explore vast and endless seas of data. So think about this quote in the context of what you're doing, even though it's about sailors on a real ocean, but we're sailing the, sea, the seven seas of data. If you wanna build a ship, 
You don't drum up people to gather wood and you don't assign them tasks and work, but rather you teach them to yearn for the vast and endless sea. And I believe that's what these boot camps do for us. That's what hackathons do for us. We see all this data and we have power in our hands to change the world, to improve the world, to make a better world for all. So teach people, teach yourself, teach your colleagues, teach your friends what you're doing. It's not about doing data, working with numbers. You're working, really working towards changing the world and making a better world. You have a bigger task, a, a gr more grander task and mission in life. Think about that. So data for good and AI for good is a characteristic of our community. So I tell people all the time, get involved. So your data, your AI applications, your sensors, the IoT, you yourself, we are all partners in sustainability. This data that we're, getting, we're collecting gives us the power to know things that are not knowable through all these different sensors. We can get involved in improving our world. Look at these 17 glo global goals, the sustainability development goals from the United Nations. There are 17 goals here, you know, no poverty, zero hunger, good health, quality education, gender equality, clean water, sanitation, affordable and clean energy. Look at these. Those sound great, but what do you do with those grand goals? Well, the exciting thing is that the United Nations just didn't stop with these nice ideals, but they gave us real actions. So underneath those 17 goals, if you go to the, the global uh, United Nations Global Pulse website, you'll see two, what they call 230 in indicators, 200, over 230 indicators. I like to call these key performance indicators. So in business, we call those KPIs. In business, we have a KPI, key performance indicator. These are the things that we measure and see how well we're doing. So there's 230 key performance indicators for our world provided by the United Nations Global Pearl site that address our performance toward achieving these global 17 global sustainability goals. And so we can apply data and AI because remember, data is about everything that is being quantified and monitored, populations and, and people, smart cities, smart forums, smart highways, smart manufacturing, climate and environmental sensors, sensors everywhere. And from all these data, we discover patterns and insights that lead to action, lead to value creation. Remember those patterns, class discovery, correlation discovery, surprise discovery, association discovery. So get involved, use your data for social good. Look at these key performance indicators. These are performance metrics for our world. They are measurable, actionable. Patterns can be found. We can take action and improve our world. So data is everywhere. It's a part of everything. Without data, you're just another person with an opinion as this guy said. So data is everywhere, it's part of everything. Data science is about connecting the dots. It's about finding the relationships and the patterns in the data, discovering new knowledge. So with all this data and this new knowledge, get busy, create, and do something. So thank you very much for listening. And remember, the real power of AI is not artificial. It's accelerated intelligence, actionable, adaptable, amplified, assisted, augmented intelligence. That's what you can be, and that's what your data can be. Uh, so thank you very much for listening today, and congratulations on your achievements uh, in, in this boot camp. Uh, congratulations to all of you. And I guess there'll be some time for a few questions. Wow. OK. OK. This has to be, uh, this is the most extensive big picture presentation that I have been in. And uh, Professor Kirk, we have some questions in the Q&A session. Uh, I'll read some of them out. Uh, someone says, how close to reality is the technology of NANAS? I don't know if you can see that yet. What was, I'm sorry, what was the word there? Uh, well, the NANAS, NAN, I don't know, okay. Uh, please check the Q&A session, uh, okay. Q&A, uh, uh, okay. the first question. Okay, so I, I, yeah, yes. So thanks, so I think we should, we can read them how. Okay, let's so, on. Yes, yeah, so like everyone. I, I, 
Okay, Lake, you can start from there. I'll on, check I'll... the chat window. Okay, so someone okay. is asking okay. this question, our uh, prof. So someone is asking that. Oh, oh nanites. Okay, so someone is like carbon nanotubes. Is that what the question is about? Yeah, so let me read this out. Um, so somebody is asking that what are the top challenges you currently face as a professional uh, data scientist and how do you go about tackling them? The challenges that you currently face as a professional data scientist and how do you uh, tackle them? Well, there's, uh, there's, di there's different types of challenges, uh, some of which are technical. Uh, for example, uh, a technical challenge, for example, is when you work with people who have a lot of data, for example, organizations, they have uh, data in different silos. So data integration is a big challenge. And the way I like to tackle that with people is I, I, I tell them that you really should find the links and associations, the things that connect the, the different silos of data. So the value is found in finding those connections. So then it becomes more of a cultural challenge, which is people say, well, then, okay, this is great, but how do I, how do I do it? How do I get my business to do it? And I tell them, well, start, start small, but think big. And what do I mean by start small is let's talk about what patterns you can find. And it's not about, again, the, the machine learning and mathematics. It's about class discovery, correlation discovery, anomaly or surprise discovery, and link association, link discoveries. So when I talk talking about those types of very natural ways of explaining what pattern discovery means and how from those patterns, we can build predictive and prescriptive models and inform our decisions, then people can start understanding what I'm talking about. So we can overcome the cultural challenge by putting it in very human terms to explain to people that the things we're doing, yes, they're very mathematical, very techno technical, use a lot of uh, complex technologies, but it's really about replicating what we do naturally as human beings, amplifying, accelerating, augmenting our natural intelligence with pattern in and insights discovery from our data to generate value and action. So putting these things on human terms helps to make it more comfortable conversation with people, <coughs> excuse me, to address the, the cultural challenge. And when they think about that, and I talk about the way you're going to make, be able to connect those dots is just, is just start connecting your many diverse data sources, start integrating. For example, you have customer data, you have purchase data, you have sales data, you have customer call center data, you have customer records, you have all kinds of different records of customers and different databases within the company. Start combining them to see what, what are the patterns in your customer purchases? What are they buying? What are they saying about your product? What product do best at different times of year? These are very natural things that business do, and we can use AI to amplify, augment, and accelerate all the things that you naturally do in your business. And once I have those conversations, uh, some of those challenges sort of melt away because people now realize it's not necessarily about the complex math. It's really about making our business successful, and that's really the bottom line. Awesome. Wow. Thank you so much, Prof. Thank you so much. That's very, very uh, inspiring. <laughs> That's a very inspiring answer. I I'll just take one or two more uh, for time so that, because I know uh, Prof has a very busy, busy uh, schedule. Okay. So there's another question here. Uh, this person is saying that uh, this is really huge. I never knew AI went this deep into data, but resource available online uh, doesn't really focus on this. My question is, is it possible to delve into this advanced field of AI without majoring in machine learning, that is AI at postgraduate level, without majoring in AI at postgraduate level, that is it possible you know, to delve into advanced field of AI? Absolutely. I mean, I know people doing this who haven't even gone to any kind of college. Yeah. All right, so you can, you can delve into these fields at any level, it really doesn't matter. Uh, I do like to tell people though that to be, to, to be uh, careful about your decision making there because if you're really interested in the research side of this like discovering new algorithms and do it and uh, doing research then yes postgraduate work is essential for research uh, if you want to advance well, say in a business like to, maybe to be uh, coming like a chief technology officer or you know a, a higher level advancement uh, you know then, ha then having a college training even like a, a master's of business administration so college education and postgraduate education can help for those career advancements, but they're not necessary for you to do this, right? I mean, anyone uh, can learn these things as long as you have an aptitude for math, an aptitude for numbers, an aptitude for some kind of technology. 
And most of that uh, starts with just having a passion for it. You know, if you have a passion for it and you want to learn it, uh, a lot of the stuff is approachable. There's, there's hundreds, if not thousands, if not millions of resources online where you can learn at any kind of level you want. You can learn at very comp complete, uh, excuse me, comprehensive sort of postgraduate level discussion of AI. Or you can take it uh, more of an online uh, course uh, that teaches you the basics to get you started. And from, once you get started, then you can move up the ladder of knowledge to do more complex things. So the original degree is not a prerequisite to get, to get started. In fact, uh, there's so many businesses and organizations that want to hire people who have knowledge of these things uh, that if you have even some experience, even through a boot camp, I know people who got jobs just from experience in boot camps, they can, you can get a job, that's for sure. But if you want to really advance, then you need to do a little bit more than, than just learn uh, from online courses. Uh, so the college degree is going to be essential for, for greater advancement in the, in the lifetime of your career. If you get that first job, you can, you can learn this stuff uh, right away and get started. Wow. Thank you so much. I want to go back to that nan nanite question. Can I try that nanite question again? I think the question was about the, the nanotubes, about the 4D printing. And I think if you watch the TED talk on that, which is on the link to that slide, they actually talk about the, the progress in putting sensors uh, and uh, electronic on, onto these, uh, these heart stents, uh, these medical devices. So I think, I think it's actually happening. I, I'm not familiar too much with the field, but I, I actually do believe it is happening. Awesome, thank you very much. So for time, uh, so we have Dr. Bayer. Uh, Dr. Bayer, you wanna come up now, sir? Yes, um, I think uh, on behalf of Data Science Nigeria, I want to especially appreciate uh, Dr. Kek Bon uh, for spending his very expensive time with us this evening to inspire the Nigerian AI community. <laughs> You know, uh, glad, to, glad to meet you finally. Thank you. <laughs> you you've exchanged email for the last year, I think. <laughs> yes, we have. Uh, he's been such a great inspiration. He's doing a lot for us as a community beyond uh, being physically present at this boot camp. Um, you know, our book is one of the biggest promoters of our AI book globally. He's consistently promoting the book you know, globally around the world. We so much celebrate you. And it's also working with a lot of young Africans in the diaspora. Uh, there's a young Nigerian that is working with uh, that he introduced to me, uh, which are indications of Professor Kurt Bond's commitment to genuinely building talent, especially you know, in our part of the world, you know, genuinely showing serious commitment. He's one of the most influential AI and data science experts in the world. You need to go Google it is one of the most recognized expert and authority. When they list top 10 influencers in AI data science, if you do not see uh, Professor King Bond's name there, then that list must be a wrong list. <laughs> so thank you so much. He's also very, very busy. He works with one of the biggest global consulting firms uh, in the world. Uh, to have him spend this hour with us is such a great pleasure. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. King Bond for joining us today. We look forward to seeing you again, and I'm sure your passion for us will never stop. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Bio, and thank you all. I really love this opportunity. Thank you, Professor Kirk. Thank you for joining. Oh, thank you so much. All right. Well, also. Yeah, thank, thank you so you. much. Also. You too, I appreciate it. Yeah, all right, thank you. All right, I am leaving now, <laughs> thank you. Okay, all right, bye, thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Yeah, all right. Great, great. Wura, that was a fantastic session. I mean, that was a fantastic session. Guys, I'm sure you guys are pumped up already. Uh, so again, remember... Lingo, everybody, everybody needs to go back to those slides. The content mm -hmm. there is something made of book. It's well researched. It's perfect. Mm -hmm. I'm encouraging everyone to go back and study. That is why we are in this boot camp. Lincoln, did you see that content? I mean, it is amazing. Sincerely, there were concepts that I saw today that I told you. I saw you, your RPA. I mean, <laughs> it's so, so amazing. It's so, so amazing. <laughs> it's so amazing.